right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Typing the Y Combinator. I'm Esther. I'm a software engineer at Airbnb. Um, here's what I have prepared for you today. It looks like a lot, but actually all I really want you to learn is what are recursive types and why do we care? So if at any point during this talk you find yourself lost, just feel free to stop me and ask whatever questions you might have. Okay, so let's start off with a really concrete example of why do we care? Maybe you've heard of this expression it's called the Y Combinator. And this expression is important in the untyped lambda calculus because it allows you to write recursion. So basically, without this in the untyped lambda calculus, you wouldn't be able to write non-terminating programs and you wouldn't have a Turing complete language. Um, however, one little glitch. Oh, hey. All right, so what if we want to introduce static types, but we still want to be able to write the Y Combinator? So let me actually use a smaller example to illustrate what happens when you try and introduce types to certain expressions from the untyped lambda calculus. So let's say we try to infer the type of x. We know that x must be a function. So let's say x has type a to b. We know that a must be the type of x, since we see that x is applied to itself. So we can introduce this constraint a equals a arrow b. However, once we substitute a arrow b for a, we end up with a arrow b equals a arrow b arrow b equals a arrow b arrow b arrow b, so on until infinity. So we can see that simple types are not really sufficient to type some of these expressions. And that includes both the expression I just showed, which is the omega combinator and the y combinator. Both of these expressions have x applied to itself, so we know that it's not going to work. The solution to our little dilemma here is to introduce recursive types. So let me go on with more examples to illustrate what recursive types are. Recursive types are in fact found pretty commonly everywhere. If you are familiar with algebraic data types, you might have seen something like data nat equals zero or successor of nat, which just means that a natural number is either zero or the successor of another natural number. Uh, similarly for lists, you either have a value which is nil or cons of an element of that list and some other list. So the common theme between all these data types is that each of them is defined in terms of itself. But in smaller languages such as lambda calculus, we don't have all this machinery for data types, so we really have to dig into what's going on under the hood. In type theory, recursive types have the form mu of a dot f of a, where f is a type expression. So this is the most abstract format, and I'll get into more detail as to what this looks like later on. Another way you can think of mu is as a type level fixed point operator. Again, more explanation coming soon. Um, the important takeaway from this slide is that adding mu to our type system allows us to type any term from the untyped lambda calculus. So let's see what the natural numbers looks like when you use mu to express that type. We know that the natural numbers should satisfy the type equation nat equals one plus nat. Does this type equation, does anyone have questions about this type equation? Like where the plus is coming from? Yes. I, um, I mean, I don't, I don't like it, right? Like mm -hmm. one's value and that's a type, so it like looks confusing. So one actually is representing the unit type oh, here, unit right? Type, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, so, so one is a stand-in for zero, and nat is a stand-in for successor of nat. Okay. Um, I mean, really equal. So basically, you're defining nat to be either the unit type or itself. All right. So maybe this will clear up with a few more examples. Is that because yeah. is what you yes, because there is only one t term that has uh, that zero is representing, so it's equivalent to the unit type. Um, 
Where is the plus coming from? The plus is because when you define a data type, it's actually a sum type. So in sum types, you're saying elements of this type will either be in type A or type B. And therefore, my type overall is A plus B. All right. So I'm going to move on for now, but let me know if you have any other questions. So in the, using the mu operator, we see that nat is equal to mu of a dot 1 plus a. So if you remember the generic form of recursive types, mu of a dot f of a, in this example, f is 1 plus a. And this definition is important because it allows us to define nat without referring to nat explicitly. You can think of a as being a stand-in for a self parameter to this type. So A is just the whole type. <coughs> All right, so let's do another example. Um, but I'd like to get some of your help with this one. Does anyone have an idea of where we can begin determining the type of int list in using the mu operator? L equals 1 plus int times L. Yeah. So, oh, that's the answer. Um, so given that, um, how would you transform that type equation into a recursive type? equals 1 plus uh, whatever you want to stand in for A. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Minus 1 plus whatever you want to stand in for A. Okay, so something like this, right? Um, any questions about this type? Yeah. So what is the empty list? Yes. And then plus is cons. Mm -hmm. And then what does the star operator mean? So that's, uh, that's a product type. So is basically. That, is that already defined in the plan chapters? Uh, it's a minor extension. <laughs> but essentially, you can think of the product type as a tuple, the type of a tuple. So in this case, cons takes in an int and another int list. So you can think of it as taking in a tuple of an int and another int list. What's the precedence, like operator precedence for that? Or like what's the parentheses? Multiplication first. Okay, just yeah. I missed the beginning of the presentation. Is that like the cardinality for the or what are we showing here? Uh, we're showing int list written as a recursive type using the mu operator from type theory. So this is, the top is how you would define int list uh, in a language such as Haskell, which has a lot of built-in machinery. And the bottom is how you would define int list in a smaller language without all this machinery. Yeah. Sorry, one more question. Could you substitute like one plus int star for the A and that's all the way on the right as well? And then Right, so yeah, exactly. So in a recursive type, you can replace the A with the whole type. So it would actually look like um, one plus int star mu of A dot this whole thing. Yeah. Um, so can, can mu be interpreted as this kind of like um, alternative to, to lambda that is strengthened by self-reference that lambda doesn't have? but. You can think of it as behaving a bit like a lambda, but it's a fixed point operator and lambda is sort of just a function. So mu has additional properties, as you mentioned. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, question? Uh, just think, this is not composition, it's just um, separating the mu of alpha from the body of the recursive type. Yeah, question? Think maybe one thing that will help is if you think of you can think of mu as sort of like a lambda at the type level that is like fed into a y combinator at the type level. That helps. So what the y combinator does is it like takes this abstraction and um, it basically ties the knot by making a this sort of like recursive thing inside this abstraction. Just making a recursive type out of like essentially a buffer. I'm going to try to explain some of that further into the presentation. Yeah. Uh, question? Yeah. 
Owen's going to say you can just think of like plus multiplication and that was sort of like intermediary syntax while we build a theory. Uh, yeah. Where plus is like even like a church and code in the code product. Yep. Mm -hmm. So don't look too much into it right now. Right. Okay, um, let's do one more example before moving on. So previously, our examples had to were based on data types. So now let's try one that is based on a function. So there's something called a variadic function, which is a function which accepts any number of arguments. In this case, the arguments are integers. So let's say we want to find the type of sum all ints, which behaves in this way, where you pass in a 1 and it returns 1, and if you do sum all ints of 1, 2, 3, it returns 6, and so on for any number of ints that you want to give it. All right, so I'll just walk through this one. For sum all ints, we can begin by saying this is a function which takes in an integer and returns something. We don't know what yet. We know that sometimes sum all ints will return an integer, so we know that one of the possibilities for the return type is an int. So we know it's an int which returns an int plus something else. So now we think about it a bit more and we're like, okay, what is this something else? This something else is a function which can be provided infinity arguments. And that means that even if we apply one or two or three arguments to sum all ints, our type is not changing. So what we want to fill in here is the type of sum all ints itself. So then we end up with sum all ints has type mu of alpha dot int arrow int plus alpha, or a, sorry. OK, so now I'm going to try and give a more rigorous definition of mu based on the intuition that hopefully you've acquired from these examples. So let's start by defining some terms. We have a fixed point, which is some um, x, which satisfies the equation x equals f of x. And the interesting thing about fixed points is that no matter how many times you apply f to x, you will still have the same value. There's also a fixed point combinator, which is a function fix, which takes in another function called f and returns the fixed point of f to you. So if you do substitution on these two definitions, what you end up with is fix of f equals f of fix of f. Any questions on how we got that? It's got more than one fixed point. Uh, then it just depends on the implementation of the fixed point combinator. OK, cool. So you can think of the y combinator as fix on the term level and mu as fix on the type level. So we kind of got an explanation of that earlier. To illustrate a bit of how it works, we can say, let's look at a recursive type in its most generic form, mu of a dot f of a. By the definition of a fixed point combinator, which we are saying mu is, we know that mu of f is equal to x, where x is a fixed point. By the definition of fixed points, x is equal to f of x. So now we can substitute f of x for x and get this definition. Mu of f is equal to f of mu of f. So now that we've defined mu as this equation, what we can think of it intuitively as meaning is that you can substitute the recursive type into itself. So as a concrete example, let's go back to our natural numbers, which is just nat is equal to mu a dot 1 plus a. And if you want to unroll it one level, you end up with 1 plus mu of a dot 1 plus a. Cool. So now let's get to another fun exercise. How do we come up with a type for the y combinator? Uh, Let's start with a warm-up where we type the omega combinator. If you remember from our example earlier, we got as far as saying, suppose x has type a arrow b, and then we saw that we have a constraint where a equals a arrow b. 
But now we have recursive types, so this is no longer a problem. We can say a equals mu of a dot a arrow b. And that is our type of x. <laughs> so moving on, yeah. Are those the same a that you in line three? Different a, sorry. Okay. All right, moving on to the y combinator. Let's start by looking at f. So let's say f has type a arrow b for some arbitrary types a and b. And then let's say x has type c arrow a for arbitrary type c and the same a as in f. And the reason we know that the output type of x is a is because we can see that f is applied to x of x. So therefore, the output type of x must be the input type of f. OK, now we look at what constraints we have. And we know that since x is applied to itself, the c type must be c arrow a. Oh, sorry, question? No, OK. So the type C must be equal to C arrow A. And therefore, we can write a recursive type for C, which is mu of C dot C arrow A. OK, does anyone want to take a stab at writing down the final type based on this? Uh, yeah, sure. Hint, it might not be as complicated as you'd imagine. The result of f doesn't have to be a function because I think what you're seeing is the second term. Yeah. So if you evaluate this once, then you end up with just f of x, x in the body. Uh, all right, other thoughts? I heard something earlier, like you don't need a mu in the final type. Yeah, I thought the final type would just be a to a. Mm-hmm. OK. I don't know how to get there. I'm trying to work out. <laughs> that intuition is correct. So what I got actually is a arrow b arrow b. And this is because you know that once you apply f, assuming that f is given the correct argument type, then you're just going to get a b out of f, since we said that the type of f is a arrow b. So the final type is actually a simple type. Why did you yeah. say that because x calls itself, therefore mm -hmm. you know that it's got to be c arrow a? How did you get that? So when you have x applied to x, you know that the input type to x must be the type of x. So if we say, suppose for a placeholder, let x have type c arrow a, well, we look at what c could be. And then we look at where applications involving x happen. And we happen to see that there's x applied to itself. So that means that the argument type c is equal to whatever type we choose to assign to x. I guess so, but how did, that's yeah. the same a for 1 and 2, correct? Yes. How did you know that? Because f calls x, therefore it's got to be a, because we know that a. Okay, yeah. Yes. All right, so we did it. Typing the Y Combinator, we're done. But there's more to recursive types than that. So thus far in our examples, we've implicitly said that mu of f is equal to f of mu of f. So now we're going to talk a little bit about how recursive types work in actual type systems. The approach we've been using is the equi-recursive approach, where we say a recursive type is interchangeable with its expansion. So anywhere you see a mu of f, you can replace that with mm -hmm. f of mu of f. The downside of this, or the upside of this, is that it's easy to add to a type system. The downside is that it's a little difficult to implement in a type checker. Fortunately, there's another approach called the isorecursive approach, where instead of saying that mu and its expansion are equivalent, we say they're isomorphic. And we introduce two functions, roll and unroll, to witness this isomorphism. And it's up to the developer to make sure that a roll and unroll are called anywhere they're needed. So let's define our two magic functions. 
let's say given some s, which is a recursive type, mu of a dot t, where t is equal to f of a, unroll of s has the type s arrow a maps to s in t. So what this means is when you call unroll and you give it a recursive type of the form mu a dot t, your output will be the same recursive type, but with, with itself substituted into any occurrences of A in T. So it's what we saw with nat earlier, where we had nat is equal to mu of 1 plus A, and then we unrolled it to 1 plus mu of A dot 1 plus A. Questions about this? Okay. Is unroll like a, a single application of it into itself? Yes. It's one unrolling. And unrolling means making it longer. Yes. It just means substituting the entire type into itself. So uh the notation of execution you basically substitute A with pass. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. In occurrences of A get replaced with S. Uh, so this convention I took from a book called Types and Programming Languages, and I find it a little more clear because people forget which, which thing is being substituted for which thing when you use the slash. Like, is it the first term being substituted for the second or the second for the first? Okay. So this is yeah. saying the first one gets substituted in for s, a gets substituted in for s. Uh, this is saying s gets substituted in for a because it's saying a maps to s. So anywhere you see a, replace it with s. Oh, okay. So you yeah. basically define the variable a to s. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But a can occur anywhere within t. Yes. All right, and then we have unroll, which is just the converse of roll. Instead of making your recursive type larger, you shrink it back down. So given some t in which the a's have been substituted for s's, you output a term with type s. Uh, what, what would happen if you attempt to do this when you add like, the initial, like there's nothing you can roll anymore? If that's a, a possible. So you know, mm -hmm. let's say you start from you know, it hasn't been unrolled at all. Right. Like you unroll once and then you roll back and then you mm -hmm. try and roll again, let's say in a type term. Right. So there are actually typing rules which govern the behavior of this, these functions. And if you tried to do what you're describing, the program wouldn't type check. Okay. Yeah. Which you might want to happen if it's not a valid program. Well, if you're rolling, if you're rolling a type that already can't be rolled anymore, then you would want that type error because the behavior isn't defined. Speaking of, oh yeah. Is this, so these are, these are type level functions, right? Are they, is this something that some programming language would have as a programming language feature, or is this just an operation that you're doing thinking about? The these are not type level functions, they're term level functions. So you call them on terms. You call roll and unroll on terms with recursive types. Yeah. What's the term in the recursive type? It's just the one instance of it? Yeah, so for example. A term would be something like a natural number. So say zero. That's a term of with a recursive type. Yeah. Alright, so speaking of how these functions behave. There's one rule about their behavior, which is that unroll of s called on roll of t called on some expression e gives you e. So what this means is that unroll inverses the effects of roll. And why is there different s's and p's? Like, is it so because this is, in this case, we're talking about how the program behaves. We assume that it already has satisfied all the typing rules. So only valid s and t can go there. 
but in order to permit enough flexibility for extensions like subtyping, we don't want to enforce that S and T are the exact same type. Yeah. All right, so in, let's talk about some production languages. Because, as I mentioned, equi-recursive types are a little bit tricky for the type checker to handle. Haskell and OCaml both use iso-recursive types. OCaml has a, an extension or a plugin, dash recursive, which allows you to use equi-recursive types, but by default, it's iso. So the reason you don't end up writing roll and unroll a lot when you're writing Haskell and OCaml code is because this functionality is actually baked into the constructors and pattern matching. So when you write a data type in Haskell, the constructors will implicitly roll up your recursive type. And when you do pattern matching, the pattern will unroll it. In Java, which, Excuse yeah. What's it mean, like, if you're unrolling it, like, I guess, I'm not even sure how to ask this, but, like, what's it look like? Like, and maybe if, I don't know what person asking this question, mm -hmm. but, like, like, to unroll something, you're basically using uh, oh, Right. And that's how you're actually doing the match. Okay, that makes sense. Cool, thank you. Okay, <laughs> cool. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good question. So, when you do, Pattern matching on a recursive type. Mm -hmm. What's it calling? Unroll. Unroll. Yeah. So as a contrast, in a language like Java, the class definitions implicitly roll, and when you call a method, that's when the implicit unroll happens. So. Okay. So now let's write some code. Hey, can you go back on the example oh, yeah. of the moment before, or if you're going to cover it later, that's cool. But when you mm -hmm. say, just say what you said before on that middle bullet about when you roll, it's implicitly doing, or in the constructor, you're implicitly doing a roll. Yes. So when you when you create a natural number, for instance, you're providing a natural number, but then you want to embed that into a recursive type. Got it, okay. Right. Like, I, I basically supplied this, but now I'm going to turn it back in. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It gets packed. Um, yeah. Sorry. What's the word implicitly here? That means that you don't have to write role in your program. Right. So, yeah. So it's like the interpreter and the compiler just does right. it. Right. Okay, cool. And you would see it in like the evaluation if you yeah. saw the evaluation. You would yeah. see it, but you wouldn't write it. I don't know what it would look like if you tried to see it, but right. it's happening. <laughs> um, and that's actually why equi-recursive types are tricky, because they try to infer roles and unrolls everywhere, whereas in Haskell and OCaml, it's built into certain features like constructors and pattern matching, so the compiler can easily figure out where to insert these roles and unrolls. Is there anywhere else that you would use it other than constructors and pattern matching? Uh, we're about to see an oh. example. <laughs> yeah. So what happens when you try to write some of this in Haskell? Haskell has recursion, actually, so you don't need to just write down the Y Combinator in order to do recursion. You can write fix directly using this expression. You just write a function, say it takes in a function, another function f, and define it as f of fix of f. But if this feature didn't exist, could we still have recursion in Haskell? All right. The reason why it has yeah. is because it's lazy, therefore it can do it. If it wasn't lazy, you couldn't write that. Yes. All right, so if you want to naively write down the Y Combinator in Haskell, this is what you get. You get an error that says, occurs check cannot construct the infinite type, T0, sim t0 arrow t. Does anyone want to try explaining what this error message is getting at? Yeah. It's like how when you said x has type a all the way a equals a arrow b. Right. Yeah, exactly. So Haskell is trying to unify the type t0 with another type t0 arrow t, but the type that they're trying to unify overlap. They both use T0, so Haskell says, I'm going to get an infinite type, can't do this. 
So instead, we can build up some data types that allow us to write down the Y combinator. First, we can define mu of f using this new type mu. And this is essentially what the term level fix looked like, except we have it on the type level now. So the type is mu. It takes in a parameter f. And it has one constructor. The constructor is also called mu. And in the body of the constructor, you have f of another mu. And given this data type, we can define roll as just the constructor itself and unroll as extracting the body out of the constructor. All right, so the question now is, is this enough to write down the Y combinator? We have our most generic form of mu, but actually if we go back and think about our types a bit, you remember that x had type mu of c dot c arrow a. But we need to be able to express the type of x in terms of mu of a dot f of a. So what we want is to be able to say x has type mu of c dot f of c, where f of c is equal to c arrow a. <coughs> so in order to be able to write down what we want, we need to also have some f, where f of some type is equal to c arrow a for another given type a. Yeah. Um, but because all of this is on the type level, we have to wrap things in constructors. So. We define another new type, f prime, and it takes in two type parameters. And this just wraps the function type c arrow a. Um, to destruct this type, we define a function un f, which pulls the body of the constructor out. And then we can define f. We can define f as taking one type parameter, and we use the generic mu operator to define f as mu of f prime c. So really what this gives us is mu of c arrow, uh, yeah, mu of c arrow a for an a not yet specified. Type c is basically, you're deconstructing the f, type f c is basically, you're actually deconstructing because it's the f of c that you're passing in? Because are so two different terms, like type and then term, which is the f, and then second term, which is the c? I'm not sure how to read that last line. Uh, the last line is defining a type called f, which takes in another type called c. And the definition of this type is just the type that we defined earlier, mu, with the parameter f prime c. Is type the name of a function? Type is a keyword that allows you to define type aliases. So we're just saying f of c is, anywhere you see f of c, replace it with mu of f prime c. Yeah. And why can't you just, um, as the parameter of f, the mu, why can't we just give that the c arrow of k? As the parameter f to mu. Mm -hmm. And really all it's doing is kind of wrapping some value of type C. So why can't we just um, say type F equals mu C arrow A? So right now A is not yet specified. And we want A to be a parameter, which is why this type alias is helpful. So now that we've defined an f which works to type the y combinator, we also have to define unroll and roll specifically for this f. So we can define unroll prime as unroll composed with, or as un f composed with unroll, and roll prime as the generic roll composed with f prime. So really what this is doing is taking the most abstract level and then saying, let's apply some logic that's specific to f. And then by composing these operations, we end up with 
an unroll and a roll, which apply for just the type f of c that we're talking about. All right, putting it all together, we can finally define our y combinator. Um, so this last line is defining a function y, which takes in a parameter f and setting the body of this function to x arrow f of unroll prime, x, x, and so on. So if you remove the unroll prime and the roll prime, you'll see that this is identical to the naive implementation of the y combinator, but we have explicitly inserted unrolls and rolls to keep the type checker happy. So the unroll prime on that second to last line is only operating on that first x. <laughs> yes. Yeah. What does dollar sign mean? Dollar sign means put everything after the dollar sign into parentheses. Yeah. Yes. All right. So here's a fun fact. If you look at this new type mu, which we defined, it's actually alpha equivalent. It's the same as the data type fix from the recursion schemes library. So instead of mu, they have fix. Instead of unroll, they have unfix. Instead of roll, they have fix. So this is pretty cool because it's like we've derived this, this recursion scheme from first principles. And now we sort of understand where it's coming from and can make more sense of recursion schemes going forward, hopefully. So I recommend looking into that if recursion schemes are something you've wanted to investigate but have not yet gotten around to. All right, so let's go into some additional theory. When talking about recursive types, the notions of data and codata often come up. So I'm just gonna go through some definitions and then try to motivate why it matters. Data consists of indefinitely large but finite structures. So for instance, all finite lists. Data is usually defined by constructors, so something like nil or cons. Can you tell me to talk to you what is data and codata? Or are you explaining that right now? Yeah, we're, I'm explaining data right now. Codata will come later. Uh, sorry, that was supposed to be a separate bullet. But um, so cons is an example of a constructor which allows us to build a bigger list using an element and a given list. Oh no, where are my bullets? Um, for data, you want to use structural induction for proofs. So it's pretty convenient. Induction is like a principle, a fundamental principle of mathematics, and most people have an intuitive grasp of what it is. The dual to this is codata, which consists of everything in data, but also includes potentially infinite structures. So one example is streams. Streams can be finite or they can be infinite. And for those of you who haven't heard of streams, they're essentially lists, but you get one element at a time and it can go on infinite, indefinitely, as I mentioned. It can or always does? It can. Um, data is defined, or codata is defined by destructors. So that means something like head or tail which you can apply to a stream to get a element and a new stream. So your destructors... Is that a typo? Yeah. Is it data is defined by destructors? Yeah, or? it's supposed to say code data. So given some stream, you can destruct it to get elements out of it, but you end up with another stream, typically. And for proofs, you want to use co-induction. Sorry about this slide, by the way. Got kind of messed up. So now let's relate this, these notions back to fixed points. If you recall the definition of int list, it was mu of a dot one plus int times a. If we abstract away the type expression here, we can define the type expression to be f, which is equal to one plus int times a. So now we can define data given this f. 
we can say the type of finite integer lists is the least fixed point of f. So data is always the least fixed point. And in this context, the least fixed point is the smallest set for which x is equal to f of x. Another thing to note about data is that you can generate all the elements of your data using f. So now we can talk about the symmetric notion of greatest fixed points, which are used to define codata. So this is the recursive type for streams, streams of integers, which we haven't seen before. We basically have a recursive type, which is the product of an integer and itself. And so yeah. That uh, can't end. You can, I guess it depends. This isn't potential. It is. Right. There is is no ending condition. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah. Because you have to take that. This is infinite, but think of a giant pool of things. Sure, sure. I'm saying you don't have to evaluate all of it. The point is that there's no ending condition in that. Type. All right. I think the confusion is that there's two ways to define strings. Strings can be always infinite, like this definition, or you can define strings to have another constructor, which allows like a like a nil, basically. Usually, you have streams, and usually it's easy to play very long. Yeah. But if true streams are codata, you define yeah. it using code recursion, and you'll make yeah. a whole data from it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess this is a slightly misleading example, but for the purposes of greatest fixed points, let's just say this is the this is the recursive type for streams of integers. And in this case, we can take the type expression to be int star a and say that the greatest fixed point of f is what defines your integer stream type. So the greatest fixed point is the greatest element or the greatest set x for which x is equal to f of x. Why is it f of x squared? That's supposed to be the footnote. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so why this matters is for type checking equi-recursive types. When you have equi-recursive types, all of your recursive types are considered interchangeable as long as they belong to the same equivalence class. So if you have some term and you know it's typed, you can only unify it with some other type by knowing whether or not the type that you currently have is a member of that other recursive types least or greatest fixed point, depending on what system you're in. And why it matters for category theorists, data is an initial F algebra and codata is a terminal F algebra. But th I'm just throwing this out there for your further reading because, to be honest, I did not have time to fully understand this concept. It was a terminal F well, you can get these slides, right? Yes. Cool. I'll send out a link to them after I fix the typos. All right, so conclusion. Um, before I start concluding, any questions about what we've covered so far? Oh, cool. So main takeaways, the type operator mu allows us to type recursive data and terms. It's defined as the type level fixed point combinator. And we have two approaches to incorporating recursive types into a type system. We have the equi-recursive approach, which treats a recursive type as equal to its expansion. We have the iso-recursive type, which treats a recursive type as isomorphic to its expansion. So this one is more manual labor for the programmer, and the other one is more work on the compiler side. If you want to do further reading, my references are here. These are actually links in the slides, so once I send them out, you can click them. Um, one really good resource is Types and Programming Languages by Ben Pierce. The paper that talks about initial F algebras and terminal F coalgebras is called Recursive Types for Free by Phil Wadler. 
And then I'd recommend doing some further reading if you're interested on recursion schemes, um, more on fixed points, because that can be a difficult concept to wrap your head around initially, and more on data and code data. Okay. Yeah, sure. The next slide is just questions, so we can actually go ahead now. Does anyone have questions? Yeah. Any chance you can go back to the slide where you uh, rolled and unrolled? Why? Don't try to roll along and uh, stack raffle, but I got missing the rolls. Let's see. This one? Yeah. We were actually trying to uh, implement this a little bit just in the UCI. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, I think to be getting like an infinite type error. I didn't know if there were any language extensions in security. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I can't construct the infinite type C7 UF prime C. C. Uh, hmm. It's possible there's a typo in this slide. So I can fix it and send it out. Um, the slides are going to be in a repo, so. I'll push up a code example that does the full implementation as well. Yeah, cool. So we're right on time. Uh, I'm happy to stay a few extra minutes if anyone else has questions, but feel free to leave if you're on your way to your next talk.